Hey, two videos in one day. Two topics today, two military topics. The first one is, uh, are the navies of today, the surface navies of today, obsolete? Surface ships. And the second thing I'll talk about is the Ukraine. So the first, out of breath here. Are the are the navies of the U.S. of of all surface fleets, aircraft carriers, all that, all those things, are they obsolete? And uh, the reason I ask this, this question is because uh, at one point I wanted to be a weapons analyst, actually, but. Um, is because of a lot of stuff that's that's happening in the world right now and because of the ukrainian crisis it's you know is china going to is china going to try to take taiwan right and i guess we'll see within the next probably short while i guess or it seems so so i'm gonna i'm gonna bring you back to something a long time ago um battleships used to be Battleships were the equivalent of what now is an atomic bomb. So your, their capital ship equaled atomic bomb. And they were so frightening, just like an atomic bomb, a beer, a hydrogen bomb that Putin has, right? Um, that's, what they, that's what they used to, to, keep, uh, to keep others at bay. And uh, you know, the more capital ships you had, the better. And um, and the and the, and the newer they were. In 1925, after World War One, um, Billy Mitchell, um, if you know who Billy Mitchell is, they named the B-25 Mitchell after him. Um, after World War One, after they won World War One, uh, the U.S had some of got hold of some of the uh of the uh, german battleships uh, and they kept them and they brought them back to the states and billy mitchell was head of the like air command and everything and he conducted an exercise which where no one else wanted him to do it and the exercise uh, that he did uh was taking a bomber and I, I think it was just a few bombers. It wasn't like a huge uh, stream of bombers. I don't know if it was a dive bomber either. It may have just been a regular bomber, but um, he said, I can sink a battleship with an aircraft. And just like the Titanic and just like battleships, they said, no way, you know, you can't do it. It's, it's unsinkable. But he did his exercise anyways, and it sunk one of the German battleships pretty quickly. I think it was like within 10 minutes. And because of that, the U.S. court-martialed him. They court-martialed him for that because he did that. But uh, back in those days, and I don't know if it's the same now, but it's 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 not as much. Um, when they did those types of exercises and stuff, there were people on the sidelines watching, maybe the media, other countries. Japan was there, and Japan saw that. And so... <laughs> That was the first time anyone sunk a battleship with a with a with an aircraft. That gave the Japanese the idea to do Pearl Harbor, along with um, the Japanese watched um, or heard the the British uh, raid in Taranto. Uh, the Italian fleet they sunk a whole bunch of battleships. So that's what caused them to do Pearl Harbor. So. This follows the lines of what I'm trying to talk about. So now you have your big aircraft carriers, you have your missile destroyers, you know, you have all that type of stuff. And and the question is, do those mean anything? You know, uh, in a place like Taiwan, which is 100 miles away from China mainland. So that's a pretty, that's a pretty dicey situation, right? There's submarines on both sides, nuclear subs, um, pretty dangerous stuff but what about the surface fleets what would happen what would happen if if the US which they're saying they they would defend Taiwan what would happen what would they do um, 
And what stands out to me the most isn't, well, actually it would be aircraft, but I believe aircraft are easily taken out of the sky, as you can you can see in what's happening in Ukraine and stuff. But, you know, there are missiles that will probably hit almost every single time an aircraft, and the U.S. has missiles that can do that. But what if, uh, what if uh, they launch a uh, fighter, I don't know if it's a MiG-31 or a uh, MiG-29, and they put a hypersonic missile on it, just like they just used in in, uh, in the Ukraine. If it's traveling at Mach 5 to Mach 10, the likelihood the U.S. isn't going to be able to stop it. So it hits a carrier and it sinks a carrier, if it does. So the other part to this is, so what if they have 50 of those? What if they have 100 of those? Um, and then the other thing is, so if it's only a hundred miles off the shore and they have to defend it, China and other countries, I'm not just speaking about China, they can have these missile, uh, anti-ship missiles on the shore. They could have thousands of them. And even if they could hit them with a missile to try to de defend their, the fleet, uh, the likelihood of saturation missiles will, will completely overwhelm it. In my own opinion, I think that um, I think ships would be pretty obsolete. Uh, and then you got your submarines too, right, trying to take out, and then you have your, you know, and your destroyers trying to trying to kill those and back and forth, back and forth. So the thing is it's yet to be seen, right? We haven't, you know, since uh, well, since World War II, we haven't seen any any true, real, real battles except for where was it with the British and um, uh, against uh, not Venezuela, but uh, was it Venezuela? It's South America, anyways. I'm forgetting it, but I, I know what it is. Um, the Belgra against the Belgrano. Um, so that's that part. That's my opinion. I think that I think that uh, missile saturation would absolutely, and the speed of missiles and land missiles, because they're hard to take out. And the second part of my video here is about the Ukraine, and um, obviously it interests me. I, I, you know, I wish to God that all this would stop. But so the question is, what are they doing? Uh, like. What what are they doing? What are they doing wrong? What do I what do I think they're doing wrong? In my own opinion, I th I think that they should have done something long ago. I think supplying weapons is good, uh, but I think they should go much further. I think the way it's, uh, the United States is showing an extremely weak hand. I don't think any one particular country is standing up for the Ukraine uh, militarily. All the sanctions and and the weapons i mean that's i think there needs to be another step they're just watching so many people get killed and that country is being decimated the question is you don't want to start world war three putin's literally making his own playbook and we're literally playing by it if he says something will escalate then then we're like oh no we can't we can't do can't do that we can't give them the mig 29s the good thing is, I remember before the invasion started, I said, I think the Ukraine will hold up. And people were like, no, no, no. And the reason I knew that is because they were giving them Stinger missiles and they were giving them uh, Javelin missiles. And those take out tanks and those take out aircraft. Those Stinger missiles will take out anything um, from 18,000 feet, but nothing above that. The Javelins are, will go right through a tank. So, what else was I going to say about? So you weigh your op, you weigh your options, right? You say, uh, well, this could start World War III, and he may well, and it looks like he was trying to make a red flag operation to make it seem like, oh, we're to blame for biological, and so he's going to use biological. He did that in four other wars. So we already know his tricks and stuff like that. What if he uses a tactical nuke? And what I think this comes down to is uh, is a is honor. 
it does exactly resemble uh, when Neville Chamberlain went and he thought he had an agreement saying peace in our time. He came back with a piece of paper saying peace in our time. Then Hitler invaded Poland. And many people, many experts agree that that's exactly what's happening. And we're, people in World War II were afraid uh, to anger Hitler. And so Putin's only card is his, is his nuclear weapons. I think it's uh, the perfect point in history to do something about this. That's what I think. And you know what? If I was physically okay, I would go out and I would help the Ukrainians out. But what's the problem? So you, what, what if World War III started, right? So it seems like they're working on a premise of it's better for 100,000 people to die than, you know, millions. And that's where I say it's a question of honor and sticking up for democracy. So what's the problem with the no-fly zone? Why, it seems so simple, just create a no-fly zone. And what the U.S. and other countries are proposing is let them make their own fly zone, give them their fighters, which, believe me, is not good enough, and they should have given them a long time ago, but give them the missile systems so the Russians can't even get in. And that is happening, and well, it's kind of happening because of the Stinger missiles, and they have anti-aircraft systems, Russian old, I think they have S-300s, which, which is a very good system of the Soviets. Um, it's keeping all their jets and bombers above 18,000 feet. Still not good because they can still bomb, but here's the problem with, uh, with uh, a no-fly zone. If you make, so they propose to make one based on humani humanitarian corridor, right? Which is humanitarian. That's what they should do. And they have to protect it. And so, so what's the issue? It's not just about doing it. And if they do it and, uh, you know, a Russian aircraft goes in that airspace and does something, First of all, they shouldn't go in the airspace. But secondly, if they, so these are the rules. If they go in that airspace and they shoot at something, um, like civilians, then NATO has to get in. So what's the problem about, about doing it just besides an obvious escalation? And that's where the problem lies. If you make a no-fly zone, the first thing you have to do is you have to make sure it's safe. Because it's Russia, or, or whatever country you're against, you literally have to go in and you have to take out all their anti-aircraft systems first. So that's a problem. Imagine how many months of planning that might take. They could have, they could have a thousand of them on the ground and believe me, they probably do. So that's my opinion about those, those two things. I know my videos are everywhere, but you know that column, you know that 64 kilometer long column, you know, they were saying, you know, why not just give them, uh, you know, give them some A-10s and they'll go and do that. And the reality is, if you remember Basra in 1991, the Highway of Death, you can look it up on YouTube and you'll see what it would have looked like if that column would have been destroyed but there's one there's one specific bomb that the US has that they've only used one time that if they gave it to the if they gave it to Ukraine boy it's a it's a bomb that it's called the sensor fused weapon you can look that up sensor fused when the bomb opens up it shoots out it's a thousand pounds you drop it out of a bomber or whatever uh, I think there's, they used to call it uh, a nickname, the 13 consecutive miracles, because they never thought they'd be able to make this bomb. It shoots out 13 skeets, and those skeets spin, and they're laser guided. They look down on the ground, there's 13 of them, they have parachutes, and they scan the ground. They scan everything on the ground, so one bomb will cover 16 football fields. 
and it scans the ground for friend or foe. So inside that little skeet has a memory of what is friendly and what isn't, and, and it will kill everything within 16 football fields. Can you imagine what an entire bomber of like 30 of those would do? Um, just one of those bombs can take out about 50 tanks. You can watch, look it up uh, on uh, Future Weapons on YouTube, the sensor-fused weapon. Thanks for watching this video.